just the other day it arrived in the mail got my california belt said ain't that swell gonna open it make sure it all checks out gonna do a little homework before i start to fill it out but i'm gonna get busy not wait too long there's a pandemic brew and things could go wrong loading's my right gotta make a choice than ever my ballad is my voice well some of those choices are perfectly clear but others i don't know who i hold dear when i'm not sure i just skip to the next and remind myself that voting is not a test the important thing is get it in on time Make sure my ballot's not, not left behind. behind. There's several ways I can turn it in. Postage paid mail, polling place, or ballot drop box bin. But before it's sent, it must be sealed and signed. My signature may have changed over time. I'm gonna see how it looks on my state ID. That's what's used to register online or at the DMV. But what if you lost it or it never arrived? Your dog chewed it up and it didn't survive. Or it went to a place where you no longer live. Call your registrar or voters and ask them to send it again. If you want a ballot in another language, let your registrar know. And they can arrange it, or you want to use an assistive device. As for remote accessible, vote by mail ballot advice. Or you can vote in person on election day. Find a voting location not too far away. Get there early, cause there's gonna be lines. Or don't wait till then, visit your registrar anytime. There's no widespread fraud with vote by mail. It isn't perfect, but it works really well. Every signature's checked. Late postmarks don't count. Ask your registrar your questions. They'll help you sort it out. There's online registration and paper, too. There are lookup tools that you can use if you want more info. Go online. Calvoter.org is open all the time. November 3rd is election day. Don't wait till then to have your say. Make sure you're registered where you currently stay. And help someone else join in the voting way. And help someone else join in the voting way. Welcome everyone, and um, I hope you enjoyed the voting song. Uh, my name is Mary Beth Moylan. I'm the Associate Dean for Academic Affairs and Experiential Learning at McGeorge School of Law here in Sacramento, part of University of the Pacific. I want to thank you all for being here. I want to apologize that our technology is not working perfectly yet, but we're going to get it there. Um, before we get started with the initiative forum, I want to thank Kim Alexander for that song, the voting song, which um, is awesome. And Kim is actually here. She's going to say a few words. Kim is the executive director of the California uh, Voter Foundation, calvoter.org. And Kim, I'd like you to say hello to people and thank you again so much for sharing your song with us and for being here. Thank you. Uh, Mary Beth Moylan. Um, I don't know if someone can turn my camera on for me. I can't do it myself, but um, uh, oh, there we go. Okay. All right. Great. Hi, everyone. Um, thank you for playing uh, the California Voter Foundation's new election song. You can actually see it as a video too on YouTube if you want to see the full multimedia production. But I just want to say real quickly um, how grateful I am to University of the Pacific, McGeorge School of Law, 
and Professor Moylan in particular, and all the students who are participating in this project. Um, we at the California Voter Foundation love to promote nonpartisan election information, and the California Initiative Forum is just unrivaled in its um, ability to reach voters and give voters the information that they really need. People take voting on initiatives very seriously, and they want to make informed choices. And thanks to the good work that the students at McGeorge have performed, not just this year, but for many years now, um, you are doing a tremendous service for California voters. So I just want to thank you um, and let you know how much I personally appreciate all the hard work that you put into this analysis and the incredible service that you provide uh, to California voters through the California Initiative uh, Forum. Thank you so much. Thank you, Kim, and thank you for everything that Cal uh, Voter Foundation does. And as I said, um, we've got the link now to the YouTube video of the great voter song in the chat. And uh, we'll also put a link to um, Kim's website. If you have any voting questions or concerns, it's a wonderful resource. It's a great place to go. So check out that website. Okay. Um, with Without too much further ado, we're going to start going through the initiatives. I know that's what most of you are here for. I do want to say a couple more thank yous. I want to thank um, all of you for actually being here, caring about educating yourselves about the initiatives and being um, educated voters. It's so important for our democracy that everyone spends the time to try to learn about these difficult questions that we're being asked to vote on. I want to thank in particular my students. They've done an amazing job. Their full reports are available on our website, California Initiative uh, Review website, which I believe we'll also be putting in the chat. You can find the initiatives at a glance there. Those are one page summaries. And then you can find the full and detailed reports, which are much longer and in-depth analyses of each of the ballot propositions that are on the statewide November third ballot. The students have done an amazing job. I'm really proud of their work. Uh, I want to welcome and thank any of their family and friends who are here. I know we have um, even a mom from as far away as Connecticut with us here tonight. And I do want to simply thank all the moms because really literally without them, uh, none of us would be here. Okay. On to the initiative forum. We're going to cover each of the initiatives. Each group of students will give you first a description of what the measure does, and then they will talk to you about some of the policy and legal concerns or considerations on both sides. These are objective and neutral analyses. We are not trying to convince anyone of how they should vote. We want everyone who leaves the forum to understand what it means to vote either yes or no on each of these ballot propositions. Format wise, we're going to talk about the first three propositions. The students who wrote the reports on those will talk about them. Then we'll take a break and we'll, talk, we'll take questions for the first three propositions. Then we'll do the next three propositions and we'll take a break and ask question, and answer questions on those and so on and so on uh, until we're at the end. So that's gonna be the format. If you have questions, please put them in the Q&A and we will take some of the questions live. I will facilitate and select some of the questions that we'll answer uh, as part of the forum. And the other questions that are in the Q&A, we will do our very best to answer in the Q&A. So we'll give you some written answers in the Q&A as well. Um, okay, with all of that, I'm gonna say that the students will be mainly introducing themselves and so I will not take time to do that, but I'll jump on during the question and answer period to help with facilitating the questions. So I'm going to have us jump right in to Proposition 14 with Soraya and Hannah, and they'll introduce themselves and get us going. Oh, last thing before they jump on, we will have uh, some slides. If you want to make your speaker views larger, you can actually use the little line in the middle and pull over the slide to make it smaller. 
um, but otherwise you'll just see a small bit of their face and a large slide unless you adjust your screen. I encourage everyone to put your screen in speaker view so that you can get the best uh, image of our speakers. And Hannah and Soraya, over to you. Um, good evening. Uh, my name is Soraya Rasamia, and my partner Hannah Fortin and I are going to give you some information on Proposition 14, which is the California Stem Cell Research Treatments and Cure Initiative of 2000 or 2020, rather. Um, in 2000, I'm going to give you a little bit of background and how the new initiative is changing the previous um, proposition, and then Hannah will give you the uh, opposition and proponents' uh, viewpoints. So in 2004, Californians passed Proposition 71, which was the California Stem Cell Research and Cures Act. That particular proposition established the constitutional right uh, to conduct stem cell research in California. It allotted $3 billion in funding for stem cell research, and that funding has been used for the development and, uh, and clinical testing of new treatments, basic research, it has funded facilities and other infrastructures used for that research, as well as some educational initiatives. The Proposition 71 also created the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine um, to oversee the program and to allocate that $3 billion in funding in the form of grants to the researchers. Um, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine is governed by a board made up from California leaders in research, um, the biotechnology industry, and patient advocacy. They are appointed by chancellors of the five UCs with medical schools, the governor, the lieutenant governor, the treasurer, and the controller. As of now, there is only around $30 million remaining available for grants. But in an economic impact study funded by uh, CERM, the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, uh, released in 2019, shows that the economic impact of Proposition 71 on the California's economy was around $10.7 billion, and an additional $4.7 billion was added to the overall U.S. economy. And so now Proposition, 1, uh, Proposition 14 is hoping to renew funding for the California Institute of Regenerative Medicine by allowing the state to sell an additional $5.5 billion in bonds to fund these grants to conduct, to conduct research trials and programs related to stem cells, as well as some startup costs for facilities. Uh, it's estimated to cost, it will cost the California taxpayer about $7.8 billion when the interest of, over the course of 30 years is, is added on to that. Of that $5.5 billion that uh, is coming from this bond initiative, $1.5 billion of it is to be allocated for the research on therapies and treatments for brain and nervous system diseases, um, such as Alzheimer's, Parkinson's, and dementia. Proposition 14 is going to increase the number of members on the governing board of CIRM, California Institute of Regenerative Medicine, from 29 to 35. It will add a working group that's going to focus on improving, improving access to treatments and cures, and it will allow CIRM to actually hire 15 full-time employees that are going to develop policies and programs relating to improving, improving the access and affordability of treatments to Californian patients. Um, Proposition 14 is also going to cap the number of full-time employees for other operational purposes uh, to 70. And it will require CIRM to spend no more than 7.5% of the bond funds on operational costs. From those funds, at least 1.5% of the total funds of the 5.5 are going to be spent on community care centers of excellence. And those are sites that actually conduct the human clinical trials for treatments and cures. Um, another 0.5% of the total funds are going to be spent on the shared labs program. And those are state funded facilities that are dedicated to research on human embryonic stem cells. And these shared sites are really important for collaboration between scientists. Uh, Proposition 14 is going to establish training programs for undergraduate students and fellowships for graduate students that are related to advanced degrees and technical careers in stem cell research, treatments, and cures. And finally, um, any invention related revenue that goes to the general fund is going to be used to offset the cost for Californian patients that have insufficient means to pay for those treatments and cures. And so I'll pass it on to my partner. 
So in regards to the proponents and opponents arguments, uh, the proponents really um, assert that uh, CIRM assisted research has led to over 2,900 published medical discoveries and two different FDA approved drugs for treatment of two forms of fatal blood cancers. There are over 800 patents pending for CIRM funded discoveries. Uh, which the proponents add would be a future source of state revenue. And while many of the treatments are still in the early stages of clinical trials, there have already been several improvements to individuals' lives. Uh, they cite that cancer patients uh, who had exhausted all other remedies are now in remission due to some of these trials. They've had success with some paralysis patients and uh, a cure has been developed for a thing called bubble baby disease. They've also added that uh, approving Proposition 14 is necessary to continue funding ongoing trials and refining and testing the discoveries that have already been made, let alone uh, more discoveries to be made in the future. There are groups that are uh, proponents that are supporters of this proposition that include uh, over 83 different patient advocate organizations, such as the American Diabetes Association, the American Association for Cancer Research, and the Juvenile Diabetes uh, Research Foundation. Uh, there are also a bunch of individuals and uh, Nobel Peace Prize winners that have uh, that have signed on to support Proposition 14. Another last thing that the proponents, uh, last main point that the proponents argue is that their assistance in funding has uh, attracted notable scientists from around the world to engage in research here in California. Um, for the opponents, their main arguments have to do with the financing of the proposition. They argue that overall, uh, with interest taken into consideration, Proposition 14 will add $7.8 billion in state debt. Uh, even though state costs would average about $260 million per year over about 30 years. Uh, the proponents say that this amount is less than 1% of the state's current general fund budget. Um, and that cures are anticipated to lower the state health costs in the long run. But the proponents also argue that the CIRM has led to fewer significant results than were anticipated originally. They also argue that the original uh, justification for Proposition 71, that the, the justification that the federal government had restricted funding on stem cell research, uh, because those restrictions no longer uh, are in place, that the federal government should be where this funding is coming from rather than the state government. And another argument made by the opponents is that because like that this vote should wait until a later date because there's a possibility that more individuals that are in favor of stem cell research, of funding stem cell research might gain power at the federal level in this next election. So overall, uh, another the few of the people that support or that are opponents to Proposition 14 include a, uh, a nonprofit called the Center for Genetics and Society, a few individuals. There are some moral opponents that are against the uh, embryonic stem cell research and um, a few newspaper editorial boards. That concludes our uh, considerations. And the next proposition is Proposition 15 uh, with Alex and Mel. Good evening, everybody. My name is Mel Locomavazio, and my partner is Alex Lee, and we'll be presenting on Proposition 15. Hello, yeah, so we will first start with an introduction, go into a brief analysis of current law. We'll overview Proposition 15 provide um, policy arguments in the form of pro and con, um, proponents and opponents, then we will end with the fiscal impact and conclusion. So to start with, Proposition 13 is a proposed constitutional amendment that would reassess property taxes uh, for commercial industrial properties every three years based on the property's fair market, fair market value. Uh, this is commonly known as a split role, and that is when the commercial industrial properties are split off from the residential property assessment. 
uh, additional, any additional tax revenue from Proposition 15 would be distributed um, to schools and local communities, municipalities. Schools will receive 40% of the revenue. The remaining 60% will go to local communities. Um, under current law, under Prop 13, um, passed in 1978, it is based on what's called an acquisition uh, value method. Uh, in contrast with a market value, market value um, method in which um, a property is assessed by the local county assessor periodically. Um, under current law, the rate of the acquisition value uh, for commercial industrial properties is no more than 1% of the purchase price or when a new construction takes place with an additional annual adjustment at the rate of inflation of 2%. So there are two other current laws in effect, Proposition 98, which created the minimum funding for schools. And this proposition says that 40% of the state's general fund has to be allocated to education. However, the state legislature gets to determine how that 40% is spent. Proposition 111 added two more tests for adding funds to school and education funding when the school funding levels in the general fund were low. So when there was an economic downturn, these new tests will take effect in order to try and balance out school funding. However, in 2017, a report from the LAO, which is the Legislative Analyst Office, it is a nonpartisan financial um, organization that helps the legislature with uh, financial reports. And it said that there's no significant increase in school funding at the time. Also, Proposition 2 um, was passed in the past five years, and that tried to create a fund that would fix the unreliable fluctuation in school funding. However, there were five requirements that had to be met in order for money to be added into the account. And so that means that right now in the same LAO report in 2017, that there was no money added into the account. So moving into Proposition 15, it will create a local schools and community college fund to hold money that is specifically geared towards education in the way that Alex just explained. And unlike the fund created in Proposition 2, there is no requirements for this money. 89% will be distributed by the superintendent of public instruction, as stated in the education code, and 11% will be allocated to the community college school district. The other section on Prop uh, 16 that I wanted to touch on is the one that explains how the money is going to be allocated. Um, communities will be compensated for the administrative costs that this creates for them. On to Alex. Thanks, Mo. Yeah, so uh, section, uh, the next section of the Prop 15 would um, do three major things. Uh, first, it would establish the operative dates for the proposition um, and also create uh, an exception for what's called as a tangible personal property up to $500,000. Um, these typically are things like computers, chairs, and other types of tangible property that assist um, in, in business operations. Um, lastly, in this section also establishes the definition um, for small business. Um, this definition is important um, uh, and I'll run through it quickly, which is the business must have fewer than 50 full-time employees, must be independently owned, operated and such that a business ownership's interests, management operations are not subject to the control, restriction, modification, limitation by an outside source, individual or business. So they may be fully independent, no franchisees, for example. Um, and lastly, the business must have own real property within California. Um, the, the next section um, 
Oh, sorry, Mo, that is yours. <laughs> Feel free to start us. Thanks. No worries. The proponents argue that this is going to bring uh, much needed revenue to schools before Prop 13 put a tax, uh, put a cap on the amount of property taxes that the state could collect. California schools ranked in the top 10 of funding for students, but in 2019, it was down to rank 39. And this is attributed to the fact that a lot of school funding is from property taxes. And this will also close the loophole that uh, makes properties currently, they're only reassessed if there are uh, improvements. And so if a property owner does make improvements on their land, then they do not have to have a reassessment. On to Alex for the opponents. Thanks. Yeah, so uh, real briefly, um, on the proponent side, I, th I think it would just help the typical, the proponents are SEIU, Chan Zuckerberg, Fund, Chan Zuckerberg Foundation, and as well as the California Teachers Association. Um, and then on the opponent side, you typically have um, California Business Roundtable, California Taxpayers, Taxpayers Association, as well as a lot of um, chamber minority chamber of commerces. And that leads me right into um, the first opponent policy argument, which is it would smirk hurt small business and minority owned businesses. Um, opponents argue that most small businesses, especially in minority com communities, rent the buildings in which they operate. And they're in a specific type of lease called a triple net lease. And this triple net lease means that they are obligated to um, pay the landlord uh, for costs revolving around maintenance, tax, uh, property taxes, um, and, and this would lead through the Prop, uh, Prop 15 lens um, and the switch of commercial industrial to increased rent um, because of these lease um, for these small businesses. And it would disproportionately impact uh, minority owned businesses, which tend to at a level greater than um, Caucasian owned businesses um, to rent the buildings in which they operate. Um, there's also an argument that it would hurt small and rural counties. And this uh, specifically comes from the $500,000 uh, tangible um, personal property deduction, which a lot of small and rural counties, um, that might offset any increased revenue they would receive from um, addressing if you so want to call it what Mo referred to as a loophole. Um, and, and then lastly, um, the one I'll touch upon here because we're limited on time is the opponents contend that it will lead to, uh, it would weaken the economic recovery that we're currently in and also lead to lost jobs. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Mo for the fiscal impact and conclusion. So the LAO estimates that between $6.5 and $11.5 billion in added new tax revenue will come from this proposition. However, it is going to also cost several million dollars per year to implement the new periodic assessments. So in conclusion, a yes vote means supporting an increase of property taxes on commercial and industrial properties, and a no vote means opposing this. And next we have Leanne and Ivy who will be presenting on Prop 16. Hello, my name is Arby Kaur and I'm a third year student at McGeorge. Along with my partner, Leanne Bolaño, I'll be presenting on Proposition 16. I will explain the change to law proposed by Proposition 16 while Leanne discusses the public policy considerations on both sides. Proposition 16 is an initiative constitutional amendment that would repeal Proposition 209. Proposition 209 was passed by voters in 1996 and amended the California Constitution to add a section that banned government and other public institutions from considering race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin in public employment, public education, and public contracting. Prop 209 essentially banned all affirmative action programs or programs intended to increase diversity in public employment, education, and contracting. 
Prop 16 would repeal this ban and allow for the consideration of race, sex, color, ethnicity, or national origin to the extent allowed under federal and state laws. But it would not require that any public entity consider these characteristics. Additionally, public entities that choose to consider these characteristics must abide by the anti-discrimination provisions provided by the state and federal constitutions and by state and federal statutes. These include the Equal Protection Clause of the Federal Constitution, along with Title VI, Title VII, and Title IX under federal law. And under state law, these protections include the Equal Protection Clause of the California Constitution, the Unrest Civil Rights Act, the Fair Employment and Housing Act, the Education Code, and the Public Contract Code. Lastly, according to the Legislative Analyst Office, a nonpartisan financial advisor to the legislature, Proposition 16 will not have any direct fiscal effect on state and local entities because the measure does not require any change to current policies or programs. Now I'll turn it over to my partner, Leanne, to discuss the public policy considerations in relation to Prop 16. Thanks, RV. Yeah, so I will be going through the proponents' arguments as well as the opponents' arguments for this ballot initiative. Um, to start with the proponents, um, First, I'll just name some of the major supporters of Proposition 16. Um, these include our Governor Gavin Newsom, our US um, Senators for California, Kamala Harris and Dianne Feinstein. Also the major um, public university systems in our state, including California Community Colleges, California State University and the UC Board of Regents. Um, so turning to the policy considerations on the yes side of Prop 16. First, um, proponents argue that um, public entities won't be required or mandated to consider these traits. Um, they simply have the option to engage in such affirmative action practices. So no one's required to do anything should this initiative pass. Um, secondly, they argue that um, Affirmative action is a way to sort of level the playing field, um, especially as a way to correct for or remedy past um, harm. Uh, that past harm being racial discrimination in particular is what a lot of the rhetoric um, discusses for this proposition. So um, by passing it, the yes side is arguing that this can help correct um, those past harms. Another argument in support is that um, 41 states already allow um, affirmative action practices such as these should Prop 16 pass. So California is one of only nine states that still bans such practices. Um, additionally, proponents argue that as a result of Proposition 209, which banned affirmative action, um, minority and women owned businesses have lost out on nearly a billion dollars as translated into today's currency um, in public contracts. So that's a consideration. Um, and lastly, of course, um, should this pass, uh, colleges and universities still won't be able to use this as a way to instill racial quotas that was banned by the Supreme Court in the 70s and that ban will still remain in effect. Um, now, turning to the no side of this proposition, um, and some major folks who are against Prop 16 include um, Californians for Equal Rights, which um, was created by Ward Connerly, who uh, championed Prop 209 in the 90s, as well as the Chinese American Civic Action Alliance, um, Students for Fair Admissions, which is an advocacy group, and um, California's Republican Party. Um, some of the arguments on the opponent's side of this proposition include that um, providing the option for public institutions to consider these traits will inevitably discriminate against other groups of folks who are not considered on the same grounds. So um, opponents are essentially saying there's no way if this were to pass to get around disadvantaging one group over another. Um, Additionally, it, kind of in line with that argument, opponents argue that race-based remedies, because again, a lot of the narrative is centered on race, um, will just further America's long racial divisions and inequities. Um, additionally, opponents argue that um, 
we don't need Proposition 16 in order to achieve diversity and inclusion in these public entities. Um, already, these institutions consider diversity through um, the consideration of, say, being a first generation student or coming from a certain socioeconomic class. So through those traits, perhaps we can continue to um, strive for more diverse workplaces or universities. Um, and lastly, the opponents argue that Proposition 16 um, could be expensive for California taxpayers. And that's mostly within the context of um, public contracting. So those were some of the, the arguments on both sides of Prop 16. Um, and I believe now we'll take a break to answer some of your questions for Propositions 14 through 16. Thanks. Thank you very much, Leanne. So we are going to now answer some of your questions. And we're going to start with Prop 14. We actually had a question in the chat rather than in the Q&A. Um, and the question came from Sarah. Does Proposition 14 protect stem cell research in California if federal research funds are reduced or not provided again in the future? So I'm going to turn that over to Hannah or Soraya, whichever of you would like to answer that one. Um, I'll go ahead and address this question, Dean Moylan. Um, so um, the federal government, if, if the federal government um, stops funding stem cell research, California does have the constitutional right to perform it. However, that constitutional right hasn't been given any type of funding unless through uh, Proposition 71, and that, that funding has finished. So we would need to um, pass Proposition 14 to, to have the funding, but, but it can happen. The only issue is that recently the, the Trump administration has put a ban on fetal tissue um, research. And so it leaves it kind of to the mercy of the administration. If, if California really wants to do the research, uh, it would benefit to have the, the funding. And I, I just wanted to quickly, your question. yeah, I just wanted to quickly clarify that they put a ban on fetal tissue research, I believe, for government scientists, and then you have to file an application for as if you're in a university um, trying to perform this perform uh, research with fetal tissue uh, privately. Yeah, that's right. And as of now, anyway, I'll let Hannah answer the next question. Sorry. Well, I think the next question is somewhat related. So Patrick had asked the question, is there federal funding for stem cell research provided to the California government? Um, and so I think that you've mostly covered that. Does anyone want to add something? Yeah, I just want to add, we, we cover in our, our paper a bit, and I just noticed that we made a, a little bit of a typo, so I'll be uh, you know filing a change for that. But the federal government has about $2.1 million planned to spend on stem cell funding within 2020, a stem cell research funding within 2020 in the federally. And I believe that that doesn't go to a specific state, but that's rather programs applying for those grants. Soraya? Actually, that's, that's $2.1 billion, oh, but it's billion. across the nation. It is $2.1 billion, um, okay. but it's in the form of competitive grants. So it just depends on um, if the researchers are accepted and it's, it, there's nothing to say that it would go to California specifically. Thank you both. We're going to turn to questions about Proposition 15. Um, there's a question about whether this proposition is really just a repeal of Proposition 13. And there's also some questions about what the effect of um, what the effects would be on taxpayers. Um, Mo or Alex, would you like to tackle those questions? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start with just uh, the direct question of is this uh, is Prop 15 essentially a repeal of Prop 13? And I, I think um, because this is part that's been used in the advocacy, advocacy campaign, um, it, there is an element of truth that commercial industrial buildings will lose certain Prop 13 protections. That is, they'll they'll go they'll lose the protections from the acquisition-based um, assessment method uh, that they gained in 1978 um, to uh, now a uh, market-based valuation. And so in that aspect, commercial and industrial buildings and um, individuals 
that benefit uh, or frequent those um, commercial industrial buildings might see an impact. So I believe that's it. And Mo, do you have any other thoughts on that? Uh, kind of tying into another question on the effect on all taxpayers. The proposition only is affecting commercial and industrial properties valued at more than $3 million. Commercial and industrial properties valued under this will not be affected and neither will residential properties. And there's nothing in the proposition that's going to that suggests that any of those changes are coming. If those changes were to come, they'd be in a completely new law and what is in this proposition is not going to have any effect on that. Okay, we have a couple of questions about how it will affect agriculture and a question from Nick McKinney about um, a, a Cal Farm Bureau ad that suggests that it will have an impact on, on um, private property. Um, I'm gonna ask you guys to answer that one. And then also uh, there's one question in the chat uh, from Kiva about whether uh, there have been any studies indicating uh, how many or the, the impact in terms of businesses moving out of state because of the increase in property taxes. So that, that's a two part question. One, uh, businesses leaving, but also the impact on the agricultural industry. Those two, and then we're gonna move on. All right, Mo, do you wanna take the uh, businesses leaving and I can help you with the tack, tack onto that? Um, sure, so what we found in our research um, there wasn't a whole lot of information on that particularly, um, again, but I'm trying to read the question. And, and, and I can just tag in while you read the question, Mo, but um, so the, the, there was a study done by Berkeley Research Group as well as the LAO, and they, they briefly accounted for this, but their analysis largely was done prior to the, to the pandemic. Um, and so... Um, there, in the LAO study, we asked for their methodology and we didn't, we weren't able to dig into the details. So, so to your answer, I haven't seen, and I don't believe Mo has seen any study, especially since uh, the pandemic to reflect the accurate um, state of the, the state of the economy that we're in. And then uh, to go into agriculture, that's a really interesting issue um, that is highly contested. Um, so, California property code is largely divided um, into numerous classifications, uh, property and improvements, um, and how prop improvements are defined um, within commercial, how improvements are defined can include certain items that would trigger an agricultural land being considered to be uh, a commercial and industrial land. Um, and so this is a highly contested issue and the, the yes on 15 campaign, and I'll, I'll just quote them uh, briefly just because I don't want to uh, put words in anybody's mouth, but um, supporters insist that stru structures or improvements won't be subject to higher taxes because Prop 15 tells assessors to skip a land loan zone as agriculture. However, uh, we, you know, we might've been more explicit about it but no county assessor is going to have a leg to stand on to call a fruit tree or irrigation system or any of that commercial or industrial. And under the current property tax code, things like fruit trees and irrigation systems could trigger a, a land becoming, um, an agricultural land becoming a commercial or industrial. So to answer your question, it, it, it's, it's fairly unclear the impact, but Okay, thank you, Alex. Um, very helpful. We don't seem to have any questions about Prop 16, so we're going to move right along to Prop 17. And it looks like Alex is going to go first. We have Alex, Stephen, and Quentin who worked on Proposition 17. Yes, uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Alex. This is my partners, Stephen and Quentin. Uh, so Prop 17 is titled Voting Rights Restoration for Persons on Parole, and it's a proposed legislative constitutional amendment. Uh, under Article 2, uh, uh, Article 2, Section 2, and for the 
California Constitution prohibits those who are imprisoned or on parole for a felony conviction. Uh, Prop 17 would propose amendments to sections two and four to allow individuals who are on parole to have their voting rights restored after completion of their prison term. A yes on Prop 17 means that an individual on parole for a felony would be able to re-register to vote after completion of the prison term, so long as they are above uh, eight, they are 18 or above a US citizen and a California resident. A no on Prop 17 would mean that individuals on parole for a felony would continue to be prohibited from voting and registering to vote until completion of their parole term. Uh, previously, the Voting Rights Restora uh, Voting Restoration and Democracy Act of 2018 was a proposed initiative, but did not qualify for the 2018 ballot. The act proposed to amend the Constitution to allow for restoration of voting rights to both uh, those in prison and on parole for a felony conviction. Uh, unlike Prop 17, uh, which would only restore the voting rights for parolees. Uh, additionally, it should be noted that there is a distinction between probation and parole. Individuals on probation are allowed to re-register to vote uh, while those on parole are not. Based on our research, the changes to the Constitution under Prop 17 are discrete, and uh, we do not see any violation of uh, any constitutional or drafting rules. As such, uh, any significant, uh, sorry, um, any discussion with Prop 17 is mostly normative, uh, revolving around who should be allowed to vote. So uh, next, uh, Stephen will be discussing the public policy concerns surrounding Prop 17. Thanks a lot, Alex. Uh, picking, off, picking up where Alex left off, uh, after the Realignment Act, of 2011, uh, parole became reserved for serious and violent felonies that do not qualify for post-release community supervision programs that are run by the individual counties. Uh, parole and probation uh, differ uh, markedly. Those on probation are allowed to register uh, to vote while on probation, whereas those on parole are not allowed to register to vote until the completion of their parole term. Uh, there are currently 56,000 parolees in California, 50,000 or so of which would have their right to vote restored if Prop 17 was passed. Uh, going into some of the proponents' arguments. Uh, so the proponents argue that felony disenfranchisement uh, laws writ large are the remnants of a legal structure designed to entrench uh, white supremacy and strip political power from African Americans. Uh, proponents say that we can see this borne out in the various states where more racially homogenous states uh, do not engage in felony disenfranchisement. You can see Maine and Vermont, uh, they both allow even the currently incarcerated to vote and they have a more uh, homogenous white population. Whereas states with more mixed populations with histories of Jim Crow laws uh, more often engage in the practice of felony disenfranchisement. Uh, and we can see this kind of historical hangover in the makeup of the parole population today. Uh, African Americans uh, comprise only about 6% of the adult population in California, but 26% of the parole population. Uh, you know, this is also borne out in statewide arrests uh, and the prison population as a whole, where African Americans account for 16% of arrests and 28% of inmates in state and federal prisons in California. Uh, proponents argue that restoring the right to vote will increase civic engagement and reduce recidivism, uh, which is when an offender is released from prison and then commits another crime, uh, getting sent back uh, to jail or prison. Uh, so this body of data is a little bit premature. There have been some states like New York and Colorado that have recently passed uh, laws or executive orders that uh, rein in felony disenfranchisement. Uh, but until the effects of those laws are able to be borne out in the data, uh, it's not entirely clear uh, how felony disenfranchisement, uh, removing felony disenfranchisement, sorry, uh, whether it will boost civic engagement or reduce recidivism. Uh, but proponents also argue that Prop 17 uh, would create a bright line rule regarding who is allowed to vote. So this goes back to the probation parole distinction we were talking about earlier. Uh, there's confusion among many 
uh, even the famous rapper Snoop Dogg, uh, whether they can vote depending on previous criminal conduct. Uh, Snoop Dogg, he was confused as to whether his previous uh, gun and drug charges prevented him from voting uh, when in fact they didn't. Uh, he had abstained from voting up until I believe this election. Uh, so parolees currently cannot vote, but those on probation can. People get confused by that and rather than risk going back to prison uh, by breaking the law, they abstain from voting entirely. Uh, proponents also argue that passage of Prop 17 will put California in line with other states that have either recently ended felony disenfranchisement, uh, so you can see Florida in the Amendment 4 uh, in 2018, uh, or they recently restored uh, voting rights to parolees, uh, such as New York and Colorado, uh, or states that never disenfranchised felons, such as Maine and Vermont. Turning to the opponents' arguments, uh, opponents argue that those who are released on parole were sent to prison uh, for the most serious offenses, uh, and thus they make it through the entirety of their parole. Uh, until they do so, they have not paid their debt to society. Uh, opponents argue that it would be unfair to the victims who live with the trauma of their victimization daily uh, if parolees were allowed to vote. Uh, opponents also argue that uh, parole is a time where offenders are, are given the chance to prove their rehabilitation. Uh, and only once they've proven that, uh, that they've been rehabilitated, should they be given all the privileges uh, that come with citizenship. Uh, however, it's significant to note that parole legally uh, is separate from the prison sentence. Uh, the California Supreme Court said as much in a case uh, called People v. Knuckles, uh, where they said that parole is not a part of the prison sentence, but it is actually uh, the opportunity for a felony offender to reintegrate back into civil society. Uh, finally, uh, the opponents make clear that parole is not for low-level offenders, but for those that committed either serious or violent felonies uh, that do not qualify for lesser forms of supervision. Uh, you know, they're not wrong. However, uh, recidivism rates for violent offenders are among the lowest, 29% uh, uh, compared to 46% uh, based on the last available data from 2014 and 2015. Um, you know, the types of offenders that recidivate at the highest rates are, are actually property and drug offenders. And you can imagine why, you know, uh, drug offenders, there's issues of addiction there. And we understand addiction now to be a, a disease and not a moral deficiency. And, you know, property offenders, there's issues of poverty where California has vast inequality uh, in wealth. Uh, and people also age out of violent crime uh, or their peak crime years. Uh, younger people, those 18 to 24, have recidivism rates uh, between 60 and 70 percent, while those over the age of 60 have a recidivism rate of only about 20 percent. I believe we need to get the ball rolling. Um, so I believe I'm going to turn it over to uh, Proposition 18 uh, done by Yev and Rachel. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Rachel Puglio and I'll be presenting on Proposition 18 today with my partner Yev Pislar. So as you can see, Proposition 18 is a constitutional amendment to allow 17 year olds to vote in primary and special elections. Currently in California, only US citizens who are at least 18 years old and residents of California and also registered to vote may vote in a California election. 16-year-olds who are U.S. citizens and residents of California are able to pre-register to vote so that when they turn 18 and their registration will automatically go into effect and they will be eligible to vote. Under this constitution, this constitutional amendment, excuse me, um, it would give 17-year-olds the ability to vote in primary and special elections if they will be 18 by the time of the next general election. Um, we, according to our research, we found that there was likely no conflict with the federal constitution in this case. Um, under the US constitution, states cannot abridge the right to vote based on age if a person is over the age of 18. Prop 18 merely expands that rule by lowering the voting age, so it's not in violation. A yes vote on this, on this measure, as I said before, allows eligible 17-year-olds who will be 18 years old 
by the time of the next general election to vote in the primary election and any special election elections preceding the general. A no vote on this measure retains the current rule for elections that no one younger than 18 years old may vote in any election. And my partner Yev is going to tell you a little bit about other states and um, the pros and cons of Proposition 18. So currently there are no states that allow 17 year olds to vote in the general election. However, there are uh, 17 states and DC that allow 17 year olds to vote in the primary in special elections as Prop 18 would allow. However, uh, and so 15 of those states, including uh, and DC, uh, enacted this right to vote uh, by the legislative body. So it's a statutory right, whereas only two of them uh, grant this voting right in their constitution. Uh, so those two constitutional initiatives were enacted by the voters. Uh, so of the three times when uh, such a proposal was brought before voters in other states, it uh, passed twice and failed once. And in terms of the voter, uh, the effect on voter turnout, uh, currently the data is uh, very insignificant. So it's difficult to say whether or not it will increase uh, the general vote, voting turnout. For example, in Colorado earlier this year, uh, the 17 year olds had a voting, voter turnout of 45.24%, whereas the general election, a general populace had a turnout of 45.5%. Uh, and the same is seen in the uh, local elections as well. So the proponents of Prop 18 uh, have uh, two kind of arguments in favor of this proposition. The first one is civic engagement. And so with uh, with a lot of 17 year olds, uh, with the primary being in March and sometimes in June, that is when 17 year olds are seniors in high school and taking the civics uh, courses. And so by allowing them to vote, it would allow them to uh, get into the, this habit of voting. Uh, it will uh, help them read the ballot, figure out how to vote. And hopefully by instilling this new habit of voting, this would eventually increase voter turnout. Uh, the second uh, argument in favor of Proposition 18 is that this idea of consistency, where 17 year olds are able to, and some of them pay taxes and work, uh, and they can also join the military. Uh, however, they still need parental consent to join the military, which the proponents don't always mention. Uh, and then the opponents of Proposition 18 bring up uh, three concerns. Uh, the first concern is that. 17-year-olds uh, are not legal adults. According to the Family Code, uh, a, uh, an adult is anyone above 18. The second concern is this idea of undue influence uh, because 17-year-olds are still in high school, uh, especially as seniors in high school, they're looking to go on to college and universities and things like that. And so uh, with that, uh, we're gonna go ahead and turn it over to um, Nicolette and Eric for Prop 19. Thanks, Yev. Hello everyone, my name is Eric and along with my partner Nicolette, we'll be discussing Proposition 19, which deals in large part with uh, changes to property tax uh, transfers. So I'll be discussing current law and what Proposition 19 uh, proposes to change. And Nicolette will discuss the policy implications and uh, the proponents and opponent point of views. So under current California law, um, California homeowners who are over the age of 55, those who are severely disabled or those who are victims of natural disasters are allowed to sell their current residence and transfer the property tax base value of that residence to a new home uh, that's equal or lesser value anywhere within uh, their county or to another county in the state that allows um, for out of county transfers. Um, additionally, um, those who transfer their primary residence to a child um, that's used as a primary residence are able to keep the same tax base. Um, the valuation for that tax base is either based off of uh, the value of the or the fair market value of the home in 1976 
um, when a change of ownership occurs or when the home is newly constructed after that date. Um, additionally, a grandparent is allowed to give their primary residence to a grandchild um, so long as the parents are uh, deceased. So the proposed law um, under Proposition 19 uh, would allow for these transfers um, if you're over the age of 55, uh, severely disabled or victim of uh, natural disaster to occur anywhere in the state. So it gets rid of any county ordinances that uh, prohibit out of county transfers. It also allows this exception to occur up to three times for those who are over the age of 55 and those that are severely disabled. Again, it still has to be um, uh, either equal or lesser value of the home that they currently reside in. Um, additionally, um, it requires that if a parent wants to transfer their home to uh, their children, it has to be used as a principal residence. So it changes the language of primary residence to principal residence. Um, and it also adds a new formula to uh, reevaluate the taxable value of the new homes if it's significantly greater than the fair market value um, of the home that they're currently living in. And they use a $1 million uh, plus or minus benchmark uh, in that formula. Um, additionally, Proposition 19 will create two new funds based off of any projected income that the state gets from uh, the implement implementation of uh, Prop 19. The first fund is the California Fire Response Fund, which would receive 75% of the funds gained, and those funds would be allocated to uh, special fire districts in Cal Fire to uh, deal with staffing issues. Um, and then the County Revenue Protection Fund would receive 17% of any additional funds. And those would go to counties that would lose money or lose revenue from people leaving uh, their county due to the implementation um, of Prop 19. And now I'll turn over to Nicolette to discuss the policy implications. Thank you everyone um, for coming and thanks Eric for passing it over to me. Some of the policy arguments on the proponent side revolve around um, these vulnerable populations that are in question in this proposition. Um, a major point from the proponents um, is that this proposition would allow those who are severely disabled and who are over 55 to move uh, their housing closer to family, medical care, or a home, a home that is um, more suited to their needs. Furthermore, um, under this proposition, it would help those who have been affected by wildfire. Over 20,000 homes have been destroyed in the past few years by fire, not including the ones that have recently um, gone up and down our state. Proposition 19 would provide savings and tax incentives to those who have been harmed. Additionally, as Eric noted, this proposition would create a fund that would in turn give hundreds of millions of dollars in revenue directly to cities, counties, and special districts for fire protection and community services. Some additional arguments that proponents um, put forth is that the passage of this proposition would open up tens of thousands of homes that have not been on the market for decades, and that this will in turn help stabilize housing costs in our current housing crisis. Uh, finally, proponents argue that this will close loopholes that benefit celebrities, the wealthy, um, and East Coast investors and that this current system we are under has created a structure where Californians pay 10 to times, 10 to 20 times more in property tax, taxes than their neighbors. And um, some of the proponents for this proposition include the California Professional Wildfighter, Wildfire Firefighters and California Association of Realtors. Uh, some of the opponents for this proposition include the Howard Jarvis Tax Association and the majority of California's major newspapers, including the LA Times and the SF Chronicle. Um, opponents note that the Legislative Analyst Office has stated that this passage of the proposition will result in 40,000 to 60,000 families facing an increase in property taxes annually. Additionally, the LA Times has argued that this structure will benefit early purchasers, meaning early temporarily, um, and that those early purchases will have the buying power in the market, and that this in turn will not benefit those who are severely affected by our current housing crisis, such as first time buyers or renters, because those populations will no longer be, um, will be even further at disadvantage in the market. Additionally, opponents argue that this proposition was essentially already on the ballot in 2018, 
um, under Proposition 5 from that year. And that Proposition 5 was rejected by 58% of California voters. Finally, opponents argue that the structure created from Proposition 13 in 1978 and the subsequent related proper propositions that created our current structure already affords tax protections for the vulnerable groups um, at play here and that they don't need further tax shelter. And with that, I will pass it back to Dean Moylan for questions on um, our proposition and the other two before us. Great, thank you, Nicolette. Um, okay, so we are going to take questions now on Prop 17, Prop 18, and Prop 19. Um, we have a few questions that have already been answered on Prop 17, but I do want to just touch upon one of them because I think it might be a point of confusion for, um, for more people. So there was a question about whether or not um, uh, people would need to have paid restitution prior to being allowed to vote. This is an issue that came up in Florida uh, with some amount of uh, fanfare there and lawsuits and has been uh, pending in the Florida courts. Um, Stephen or Quentin or Alex, would you like to explain how that doesn't apply here? Yeah, uh, if I can take that. So uh, restitution doesn't really factor in here uh, under the language of Prop 17. Um, uh, you know, there's no, there's no, you know, real reference to restitution. It, it doesn't come into play. Uh, yeah, I spoke with the proponents of the measure, uh, the people backing it, and they said that the opposition here is 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 not like that in Florida. Uh, they don't expect any challenge of of that nature, uh, nor would I think such a challenge be uh, successful in under the language of the amendment. Thanks, Stephen. Yeah, it's really very clear. We're simply changing the language of the California Constitution to allow for people who are on parole to exercise, to register and exercise their right to vote as long as they meet uh, other criteria of being a U.S. citizen and being 18 years old. So those are the only, and mentally competent. Let's not forget that one. Okay, thank you. Um, we have a, a few questions about Prop 19. I didn't see any about Prop 18. I think that's straightforward. Um, one for 19 is uh, what is the difference between a principal and a primary residence, if any? Can either Eric or Nicolette explain? Sure, I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, so I think that that's part of the ambiguity that's in, in Prop 19. Um, one of the uh, the proponents of Prop 19, Prop 19, sorry, argue that it would prevent people from transferring their, their homes to their children to use as second homes or as vacation homes. Uh, so it's stronger language, um, which could be interpreted as they have to live in it. It has to be their, their home, that their primary residence, um, which they're ch that's the language that they're changing it from. So uh, we think it's just, it's stronger, but throughout uh, California law and code, they, they switch primary and principal um, pretty interchangeably. Thanks. We've also just had another Prop 19 question come up in the chat. Um, and the question is, what is or could be the source of state revenues that would become part of the wildfire funds? Can one of you explain um, where that money is coming from? Sure, so that would be coming from, um, I believe, and I can type it in the chat if we, if I find otherwise after, but that would be coming from the revenues from this specific initiative. So the tax increase. Okay, thank so you. I'll add a, just one quick thing on it. Um, there's a little discrepancy uh, between different agencies. I know the LAO says there's gonna be an increase of revenue from, from this. Uh, I think the Board of Equalization says the state's gonna lose revenue. Uh, so it's really a wait and see until it's implemented uh, type of analysis has to be done. I think the important thing is that there is no uh, secured funding that would go into that fund. It would, only, um, it would only become funded if there is an increase in revenue. So I think there, that's an important point to make. Thank you guys. 
Okay, we're going to move along to uh, Proposition 20. We'll continue to answer questions in the Q&A um, after we move on to different initiatives. We'll go back and try to make sure we're getting everything answered. So um, we're going to head on over to Proposition 20, and we have Nikki and Irene. Thanks, Dean Moylan, and good evening, everybody. My name is Irene Myers, and my partner is Nikki Rosetta, and we will be covering Proposition 20. I will be going over what Proposition 20 does, and then I will hand it over to Nikki, who will be covering some possible issues with the proposition. So Proposition 20 is called the Reducing Crime and Keeping California Safe Act of 2018. There are three main categories to Proposition 20. First, parole considerations, second, DNA collections, and third, criminal sentencing of theft crimes. So first of all, Proposition 20 changes parole considerations. In 2016, Proposition 57 increased the number of inmates eligible for parole by awarding credits towards parole eligibility and also amended the constitution to allow individuals who were convicted of nonviolent felonies to be eligible for parole consideration after serving the full prison term of their primary offense. Proposition 20 adds 51 new offenses that are ineligible for release considerations by redefining them as violent felonies. Um, and Prop 20 also proposes a new standard for parole hearings and the new standard of review that would allow the victims and the prosecuting attorney to have a greater role in the parole hearing. Second, Proposition 20 changes DNA collection requirements. In 2014, Proposition 46 uh, made wobblers, which are crimes that could be charged as either felonies or misdemeanors. Uh, so those wobblers became mandatory misdemeanors. Proposition 20 addresses those mandatory misdemeanors and would require DNA collection from those mandatory misdemeanors. Current law only allows DNA collection from any person who is convicted of a felony or arrested for a felony offense. Finally, Proposition 20 changes criminal sentencing of theft crimes by adding two new misdemeanors. First, it adds serial theft, which is defined as two or more convictions of petty theft, shoplifting, grand theft, etc. And second, it adds organized retail theft, which is defined as working with another and committing two or more retail thefts within 180 days of each other and the stolen goods are more than $250. Now I will turn it over to Nikki. Thank you, Irene. As uh, um, Irene mentioned, my name is Nikki Rosetta and I will be discussing some of the issues that we flagged when we were going through Proposition 20. The first of these issues is that Proposition 20 tries to reverse some of the measures that were implemented by Propositions 47 and 57. Those two propositions were successful in reducing California's prison population by 20,000 inmates without seeing any significant increase in the crime rate as a result. California has long struggled with overcrowding in its prisons, and in 2011, the United States Supreme Court ordered California to reduce its prison population in order to protect the rights of inmates against cruel and unusual punishment as recognized by the Eighth Amendment. By reducing or reversing some of the provisions from Propositions 47 and 57, we are concerned that we might see a rise in the prison population in California, which is of particular concern given the COVID-19 pandemic. The second issue we wanted to flag for you is that um, also related to changes to Proposition 57. Proposition 57 was a constitutional amendment, whereas Proposition 20 is only a statutory change. There's a greater number of signatures that is required in order for a proposition to qualify for the ballot if it is going to be changing the constitution. Here, Proposition 20, by making changes to Proposition 57, may in effect be changing the constitution without meeting the procedural requirements to do so. And um, this is because they have, uh, Proposition 20 would create a list of offenses that would be considered violent felony offenses for purposes of parole consideration which is governed under section 32 of article one of the California constitution. And by doing this would be taking away some of the power that the California constitution gave to the California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. This challenge has been brought to the courts um, 
but the court has decided to wait to decide the issue until after the election. It is common for courts to wait to decide a substantive challenge to provision until after the election in order to give voters a chance to um, have a say in the measure in case they find that the provision is valid even after the challenge. So this has an effect on what a yes vote would mean because if after um, Proposition 28 receives a yes vote, the court will hear this challenge. And if they find that the parole consideration provisions are invalid, those will be severed from the measure. So this means that the DNA collection provisions and the retail theft crimes will still take effect, but the parole considerations will not. So if you are in support of changing the definition of violent felony offense, but care less or have concerns about the DNA provisions and the retail theft provisions, your vote would be going towards those measures and may not be changing the definition of a violent felony offense. Which brings me to the third issue that we wanted to flag um, your attention with tonight, which is that propositions must only address a single subject. And the purpose for this rule is to kind of prevent some of the same issues that we're seeing with Proposition 20. This is to make sure that voters understand the effect that their vote will have, and also to prevent proponents from adding something that's very politically popular in order to garner enough support for things that may not have, uh, or for policies that may not have their support on their own. However, um, all three subjects that we see addressed in this, the parole considerations, DNA collection, and retail theft crimes do all relate to criminal law. And this rule has been interpreted rather broadly by the courts. So if a challenge was brought against Proposition 20 for this rule, it's likely to survive that challenge. That's all we have for Proposition 20. So I'm gonna send it on to Jake and Michael for Proposition 21, thank you. Thank you guys. And good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Michael Mendez. I'm a third year student at McGeorge and I'm presenting Proposition 21 with my partner, Jacob Gavin, also a third year at McGeorge. To start, I'm gonna tell you a bit about the existing law that Proposition 21 would be affecting. Uh, this is gonna be a little specific, but I'll be brief through this. Existing law exempts certain kinds of housing from local city or county restrictions on rent control. There are three main exemptions. First, housing first occupied from 1995 onward is exempt. Second, housing that was already is exempt as of 1995 remains exempt. Third, single family homes and units with a title separate to that of any other dwelling unit are exempt. At the start of a new tenancy, Landlords are able to establish the rental rate and any local restrictions cannot infringe on a landlord's right of fair return on their rental properties. That's all current law. Now, it's important to note that Proposition 21 would not force cities or counties to do anything. It would just allow them to regulate rent control properties with fewer restrictions from state law. Proposition 21 amends three sections of the civil code. First, the exemption for housing from 1995 on, which covers housing occupied in the last 25 years, is reduced to an exemption for housing first occupied in the last 15 years. Second, the exemption for housing that was already exempt as of 1995 would be eliminated. Third, the exemption for single family homes and other dwelling units with separate titles would remain, but only if the owner has no more than two such residences. On the financial end of things, the amount by which an owner can raise rent at the start of a new tenancy would be restricted to 15% over the course of those first three years of the new tenancy, which is calculated in addition to any rent increases also permitted by local government. This is in contrast to the current permitted rental rate increase of as much as 10% annually. To reiterate, even though the courts have already stated as much, Proposition 21's language includes a provision that no local rent control measures can infringe on a landlord's right of fair return. Now, to tell you a little bit more about the policy considerations, I'm gonna hand things over to my partner, Jacob. Thank you, Michael. My name is Jake Gavin, and I'm a three, uh, third year student here at McGeorge. Let's get into the policy regarding this proposition. Now, starting with the proponents, proponents generally cite statewide statistics to support the argument that rent control is needed to improve rent affordability, help homelessness, and reduce environmental harm. Moving to rent affordability, of California's 6 million renters, one in three spends 50% of their income on rent. Simply put, the proponents argue that if these people can afford the, their rent, 
um, then they will be able to afford other life necessities such as groceries, et cetera, if this proposition was enacted. Moving on to homelessness, um, as of 2019, 151,000 people were homeless in California. As we all know, with the COVID pandemic, I'm sure that number has gone up, but the proponents nonetheless argue that homeless people would be able to afford rents and move into these rent controlled units if this proposition was enacted once again. And thirdly, moving on to environmental harm and the reduction of environmental harm, importantly, the proponents argue that if people can afford to live closer to where they work, their environmental footprint on the, um, of course, environment will be reduced in that their commutes, especially from their cars, uh, will be reduced because they can afford to live in cities, say, where they're working, which is closer to their home. The biggest individual supporters of this uh, bill, or rather proposition, is uh, U.S. Senator Bernie Sanders. And the biggest organizational supporter is the California Democratic Party. Now, moving on to the opponents' arguments and the opponents' uh, supporters. So opponents generally argue that rent control will not fix California's housing problem and that other innovative solutions should be created. Additionally, they cite how the passage of this proposition would lead to a substantial loss in tax revenue for state and local governments. Now, moving on to the opposition's arguments. First, um, opponents cite how voters rejected Proposition 10 by about 58% in 2018, which was a very similar rent control measure to this one. The argument here is that if people rejected, uh, rather voters rejected the Proposition 10, they should also reject this uh, rent control measure as well. Secondly, and the most important, is the California Legislative Analyst Office, which other groups have mentioned before me, estimates that tens of millions of dollars per year would be lost in state and local revenue. Of course, uh, with the COVID pandemic, which has severely restricted uh, any sort of budget in the state and in local municipalities, um, this would be a hard hit to those budgets. Lastly, Middle-class renters who are seniors, veterans, or disabled are offered no protections under this rent control policy. Now, these special groups are generally the biggest opposition to this proposition. And the argument here, simply put, is that there should be special carve-outs for these groups. Now, moving on to the biggest individual opponent, which is Governor Gavin Newsom, because of AB 1482, which caps annual rent increases at 5% plus inflation for tenants, up to a maximum of 10%. Michael and I would be happy to answer any questions about AB 1482 uh, in the Q&A afterwards. And the biggest uh, organizational opposition to Proposition 21 is the California Chamber of Commerce due to the lack of tax revenues, uh, which would occur if this proposition was enacted, as I mentioned a bit earlier. Thank you for listening. Michael and I are happy to answer any questions, of course. Um, now I'm going to pass the presentation to Matt and Kylie, who will discuss the hot topic of Prop 22. Thank you. Hi, everyone. My name is Matt Urban, and I'm going to take you through Prop 22 and how it would change existing law. And then my partner, Kylie Zacklin, will discuss some policy issues that the initiative brings up. So Prop 22 is called the Protect App-Based Drivers and Services Act, and it provides an exemption for network companies to classify their app-based drivers as independent contractors and not employees. Now, the law defines two types of network companies. There are transportation companies like Uber or Lyft, and then there are also delivery companies like Postmates and Instacart and DoorDash. If California passes Prop 22, it will override AB 5, which was enacted in 2018. And that law sets three factors for determining whether a worker is an employee or an, in, or an independent contractor. The law presumes a worker is an employee, but a worker may obtain independent contractor status if the worker is free from the hiring company's control and direction in the performance of work. If the worker is doing work that is outside the company's usual course of business, and if the worker is engaged in an established trade, occupation, or business of the same nature as the work uh, performed. Now, what Prop 22 would do is declare that all app-based drivers are independent contractors if they meet certain conditions. <clears throat> now, those conditions are that network services may not require uh, that uh, app-based drivers work specific dates or times of day or a minimum number of hours that the driver has to be logged into their network. Uh, they can also not uh, require that app-based drivers accept any rideshare or delivery service requests as a, main, as a uh, condition of maintaining access to the network. 
Uh, they also cannot restrict app-based drivers from performing rideshare or delivery services for other network companies, except while engaged with their own network companies platform. So uh, one company like Uber couldn't prevent another, uh, their app-based driver from working for another company like Lyft. Um, and then finally, uh, they couldn't restrict their app-based drivers from working in any other kind of lawful occupation or business. Now, Prop 22 would set uh, minimum levels of compensation, and that would be based on 120% of the applicable minimum wage for engaged time. And we'll talk a little bit more about engaged time in a moment. And then uh, they would also uh, have to get 30 cents per engaged mile to compensate for vehicle expenses. Um, there are also benefits uh, uh, that are uh, guaranteed through this law that are not other that are not otherwise guaranteed to independent contractors. Uh, so if an app-based driver works uh, 25 or more hours per week uh, for a calendar quarter, um, then they would earn a payment that is equal to 100% of the average contribution to Covered California uh, for, that, uh, for each month in that calendar quarter. And the act defines that the average contribution is 82% of the Cal uh, Covered California payment. If an app-based driver works 15 to 25 hours per week for a calendar quarter, um, then they would receive 50% of those benefits. The network services must also provide app-based driver statements every pay period documenting the hours they've accrued each pay period and how many hours they've accrued for that calendar quarter so they can see how far along they are to earning those um, titles. Uh, network companies have additional uh, duties. They have to carry insurance, uh, medical, disability, loss, and liability. Um, but uh, providing those benefits may require that the event occurred while the driver was engaged and not just online. Um, engaged uh, is defined in the act as the time between accepting a request and completing the delivery. Um, so that would exclude time waiting to accept a request. And that amount of time generally accounts for about 25 to 30% of the time that an app-based driver spends working. Prop 22 also includes public safety measures. Uh, network companies must conduct criminal background checks on app-based drivers. They have to provide uh, safety and sexual harassment training and policies. Uh, it limits the number of hours that an app-based driver can be engaged with the, with the network. So an app-based driver cannot be engaged uh, more than 12 hours out of a 24-hour period uh, in the network's um, online platform. And it also introduces a zero tolerance policy for reasonable suspicion of intoxication uh, during engaged time. And it criminalizes impersonating an app-based driver as a misdemeanor. Now, uh, Prop 22 also includes an amendment clause, and the initiative measures often include these clauses that control how the initiative itself can be amended by future legislatures. In order for a future legislature to amend Prop 22, seven-eighths of both houses uh, of the legislature would have to approve the measure. That's 87.5% of the legislature, and in effect means that a new proposition would need to be passed in order uh, through the initiative process in order to amend this law. Uh, this is a very high bar, so if California chooses to do this, they may be committed for a while and would likely have to uh, pass another initiative. It is worth mentioning, though, that there are initiatives that have passed into law that have no ability uh, for the state legislature to amend them, um, but this would be the highest bar uh, for a uh, statute that could be amended. And now to tell you a little bit about the uh, policy issues that this raises, uh, I pass it over to my partner, Kylie. Thank you, Matt. <clears throat> I'm Kylie Zachline, and we will be transitioning into the policy considerations of Proposition 22. Proponents or supporters of Proposition 22 come from many different backgrounds, including business and taxpayer associations and community advocacy groups. Proponents argue that by classifying these drivers as independent contractors, those drivers get more worker flex flexibility than if they were to be classified as employees. This is because workers would be able to create their own schedule and then also receive benefits specifically listed for independent contractors in the initiative. There would be a minimum level of compensation and benefits for these app-based drivers. Proponents also argue that Proposition 22 protects this app-based driving industry because network companies will be able to have more drivers out on the road and provide more availability for consumers. Proponents also argue that Proposition 22 promotes public safety because of the background checks that drivers will have to pass. Additionally, proponents say that the proposition will reduce the number of DUIs and help people who are staying indoors due to COVID since food can be delivered. So simply put, a yes vote classifies app-based drivers as independent contractors rather than employees. Opponents or people against Proposition 22 
include many prominent Democrats like former Vice President Joe Biden, California Senator Kamala Harris, the Speaker of the California Assembly, and several labor organizations. One big concern of opponents of Proposition 22 is that it would leave workers without protections like paid sick leave and workers' compensation. Opponents are also concerned that network companies would only be paying their workers for engaged time, as Matt mentioned, which is the time between accepting and completing a ride or delivery, but not for any waiting time or time taken to sanitize their vehicle. Additionally, there's a large fair elections concern seen as, seen as how over $184 million has been raised in support of Proposition 22, much of which is coming from the network companies behind this initiative. With the 7 eighths vote requirement to amend, opponents are concerned that the amendment provision would prevent future legislative consideration for driver classification. Opponents are also concerned that Proposition 22 could cause a ripple effect by having other industries adopt this business model of a reclassification of their workers. So a no vote supports existing law, which presumptively classifies app-based drivers as employees. And now to Dean Moylan to facilitate for questions for Propositions 20, 21, and 22. Thank you very much, Kylie. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A relating to Proposition 20. Um, the first one is, what is the estimated number of individuals added to California prisons as a result of this measure? Do we have a number on that, Nikki? Um, yeah, so, uh, oh, yeah, no, it's okay. <laughs> I answered to Nikki and Irene. Um, so I, uh, we don't have a number, but um, the effects of Proposition 47 and 57 reduced prison populations by 20,000 inmates. So since Proposition 20 is um, kind of reversing what 47 and 57 did, we can kind of assume that that would be like the maximum amount of people that um, would increase the prison population, but we don't have any specific numbers. Thanks. And while you're talking about that, why don't you hang on here? Because the next question relates to the reclassification of offenses under Proposition 47. And this question about the Sacramento Bee reported that Prop 20 would turn several misdemeanor theft offenses into potential felonies. The proponents claim it doesn't undo those reclassifications of Proposition 47. Can you clarify what is being reversed by 20? and um, maybe a specific example. Yeah, so I'll take that. Um, so there's a few things that Proposition 20 addresses. Um, one of those is it's changing the DNA collection provisions for um, offenses that used to be charged as wobblers. And so when they were wobblers, if they were charged as a felony, DNA collection was available. Uh, now they are charged only as misdemeanors. And so instead of it being left to the discretion of the prosecutor, whether to charge as a misdemeanor or as a felony, and through that decision, whether to collect DNA, it will be um, mandatory to collect DNA. The second thing is that it does reclassify shoplifting to be a wobbler, but only for certain offenders that have a previous offense. And then, it also creates two new crimes. So that's not a reclassification, but those are able to be charged as either a misdemeanor or a felony. Thank you, Nikki. And thank you, Irene, before Nikki. Um, let's take a couple of the questions relating to Proposition 21. Um, the first question with respect to Proposition 21 is, if I want to keep my rent control department, do I vote yes or no? Thank you. Uh, I can take that one. So to clarify, a yes vote is a vote to allow cities and counties to enact this expanded rent control, and a no vote means that they cannot. So Proposition 21 will not impact your ability to keep your current rent control department. This measure will allow cities and counties to extend rent control to a greater number of properties than they are able to currently, and limit the extent that rent can be raised on new tenants in the first three years of them staying there. So I hope that answers your concern. Thank you, Michael. Um, the second Proposition 21 question is, uh, is the loss of tax revenue from reduced income earned by landlords, uh, I, I think the question is asking, will there be a loss of tax revenue from reduced income earned by landlords uh, that would otherwise be subject to taxation? 
I can go ahead and take this one. The opposition certainly argues that um, Proposition 21 would be very detrimental to landlords, uh, big and small, because of course, if their properties are rent controlled, they're not gonna be bringing in as much revenue. And of course the tax loss would come from that uh, out of many other faucets as well. Thank you guys. Um, we've got quite a few questions on Prop 22. We are gonna try to take only a few of them live and then we'll answer the rest of them um, through the Q&A because we wanna to get to our last three propositions. Uh, I think that there's, there's one here about AB5 um, and, and the question is about whether or not a, an AB5 at the federal level would invalidate proposition um, 22. And AB5 was of course a state uh, bill, not a federal one, but conceivably, if the federal government were to step in and, and pass something similar, um, Kylie or, or Matt, do you want to take that? Uh, well, uh, one thing that's worth noting is that the uh, Labor Department has actually issued a, um, a statement uh, that doesn't carry the, the rule, of, doesn't carry the force of law in California that gig economy workers are independent contractors. So the likelihood of that, at least um, under uh, the current situation is probably pretty low. Um, there, there are you know, some issues with uh, you know, preemption and stuff like that, but generally states um, uh, uh, can control employment law. Kylie, was there a question that you wanted to answer on this list? I'm gonna let you pick. Uh -oh, I think time? I think someone had a question about um, AB5 even on a state level and its effects um, with the industry. And so AB5 is more inclusive, whereas Prop 22 focuses just on the app-based driver industry. Um, and so we mentioned that this could have a rippling effect on other industries um, if Prop 22 were to pass and other industries adopted the same model of classifying their employees. Okay, good. We're going to answer the rest of the Prop 22 questions in the Q&A, and we're going to move on now to Proposition 23. Hi there. Uh, again, it'll be uh, me, Quentin, and Alex. Uh, I'm going to take you through uh, the first, uh, just the four prongs of Prop 23, and we'll dive into some of the major provisions. Uh, so Prop 23 would enact four uh, major provisions. Uh, first, it would require each chronic dialysis clinic, or CDC, uh, to maintain at least one licensed physician during hours of operation. There are some exemptions for that uh, that we can discuss later. Uh, second, it would require quarterly reporting of all dialysis-related infections to the California Department of Public Health and the National Healthcare Safety Network. Third, it will require CDCs to obtain consent from the California Department of Public Health before reducing services or closing down operations. And fourth and finally, it will pro prohibit chronic dialysis clinics from discriminating against patients with government-backed insurance plans. Uh, Quentin is gonna talk a little bit about the policy now. Great, thank you, Stephen. So my name is Quentin Barbosa. I'm gonna be going over the policy considerations with you all. So first I wanna talk about uh, who the proponents and the opponents are. So the proponents, uh, the main one at least is SEIU, United Healthcare Workers. They're a union. Uh, they've been trying to unionize the uh, cr uh, chronic dialysis clinics, uh, which would be affected by this measure. And the main opponents are those uh, are the clinics, which some of which are, um, I better think about a quarter, of which are nonprofits, and then the, uh, about 75% are run by two uh, multi-billion dollar corporations. Uh, and then also a long list of patient advocates and medical professionals are also concerned about this proposition. So first I wanna talk about um, the infection reporting requirement. So the proponents, uh, they point to some reports of inadequate sanitation and dialysis clinics, um, blood stains and cockroaches mostly. Uh, and they claim that that will expose patients to infectious diseases, which, um, you know, kidney dialysis already has a, a existing risk of infectious disease. So um, because it involves, um, you know, the bloodstream. So 
the proponents think that having this data reporting requirement will help uh, with Department of Public Health oversight and ensure patient safety. Um, and it'll have low costs on the state. And next, I want to talk about the anti-discrimination requirement, and that would basically just prevent clinics from discriminating against patients from having government-backed insurance plans. Um, that's the case because uh, these government-backed insurance plans have a cap on how much the, uh, the clinics may charge. Um, so the concern is that these clinics um, want to profiteer and will turn away people with, um, with government-backed insurance plans because they can't make as much money off of them. Um, and that's the case with Medicare and Medi-Cal programs. Uh, both of those are capped. And that's probably why you've seen on all the commercials that, uh, you know, this, the, this business about like, if you, uh, if, if this passes one way or the other, I'm going to die. Um, that's because they think that the, they'll either be turned away or um, as I'll discuss later, the, some of these clinics will have to close um, or potentially at least. So the reason why they might have to close is uh, there's an on-site doctor requirement. As Stephen mentioned, uh, there are some exemptions, but those exemptions only last for 12 months. And uh, the, the exemption, uh, if you qualify, you, you can use a physician's assistant or a nurse practitioner instead of a doctor to be on-site. Um, but the, the actual text of the initiative itself says there needs to be a doctor. Uh, so the proponents claim that the, uh, the on-site doctor requirement could help oversee the quality of care and patient safety. Uh, but the opponents question the, uh, the necessity for the doctor because um, the doctor does not need to be a kidney specialist and the doctor actually um, doesn't even need to be involved in the patient care at all. Like there's, there's nothing, no guidelines or, or anything within the text of the initi initiative on what the role of the doctor is. And uh, additionally, the clinics already require that a, a physician oversee the patient's care as a whole, not just at the clinic. And uh, a kidney specialist is required to check in weekly while the patient's getting treated at a dialysis treatment center. Uh, furthermore, the federal uh, centers for Medicare and Medicaid services report that uh, California dialysis clinics actually outperform other states in clinical quality, uh, patient satisfaction and patient deaths. So that uh, directly rebuts the claims of you know, bug, bugs and blood stains. Um, the onsite doctor requirement is a huge concern to the opponents because it will, it will increase clinic costs by several hundred thousands of dollars each year. Um, and those costs would need to be transferred uh, somewhere. So the, the clinics are concerned they'll either have to uh, fold or they would have to uh, pass it on to the, the payer. Um, so opponents also note that, um, you know, moving doctors into these clinics when there's not even a clear role for what they'll be doing will exacerbate the state's doctor shortage um, during a pandemic, which is, uh, they claim is probably the worst time uh, to have, have emergency room crowding and just uh, doctor issues. Um, so that brings us to the closure requirement. So that's kind of like the direct um, safeguard from, from all these costs that are being imposed on the clinics. Uh, so the opponents claim that the on-site doctor requirement would, would make nearly half of the state's cl uh, clinics financially unsustainable and result in their closures or cuts in services that would jeopardize access to dialysis care, um, which patients need to survive. There's, there's a 30% chance of death if uh, these patients were to miss one treatment. Um, and uh, it's, it's kind of unclear whether or not there would really be widespread closures uh, because the clinics, one, they can receive an exemption, as I mentioned earlier, and also a uh, Department of Public Health uh, consent is required by this, by this initiative um, for, in order for the clinics to close or cut services. Um, so the uh, closures and cuts in services could make it more difficult for patients to get treated and it would drive up the costs of, Claire, uh, costs of care but uh, increased uh, dialysis treatment costs would also result in higher rates for private insurers. Uh, but the most likely scenario is that the clinics would negotiate higher rates with some payers and uh, just um, eat the rest of the costs themselves. Um, but that, that'll probably be the case for large for-profit corporations rather than the small nonprofit corporations, which might close. Um, but we need to get the ball rolling. So I'm gonna pass it on to uh, Thomas and Ari to talk about Prop 24. Thank you. Hello, everybody. My name is Thomas Gerhardt, and along with my partner, Ari Steenberg, we're going to be discussing Prop 24. I'm going to start with just a little intro to get you thinking about Prop 24, and Ari will explain the current law, and then I will follow up by explaining Proposition 24 and how it modifies the current law. 
Proposition 24 would create additional laws pertaining to the business consumer relationship with, with regard to consumer data. Or to put that plainly, it pertains to your rights regarding information that businesses or that you have given to a business and then that business then uses to generate revenue. So holding that in mind, let's talk about current law and then again, I'll talk about Prop 24. Ari? Uh, right, so in order to understand the impact Prop 24 would have, we think it's important to understand what California's current privacy laws are like. So as it stands today, current privacy laws regulate businesses that buy, collect, sell, or share consumer information if that business has a gross annual revenue of 25 million, buys, collects, sells, or shares the personal information of at least 50,000 consumers, or generates 50% of or more of its revenue from selling consumer information. Current law allows consumers to opt out of a business collecting and selling their information, but in order to opt out, a consumer must notify each individual business that they don't want their information collected or sold. Uh, if someone chooses to opt out, businesses are, not, are also prohibited from discriminating against consumers by you know, having higher prices or providing a difference in quality. Uh, however, businesses are allowed to incentivize the people to not opt out uh, by providing them services uh, so long as the services are tied to the data's value. Um, as it stands today, the California Department of Justice is the regulatory body for consumer privacy in California uh, at an annual cost of about $4.25 to $4.75 million per year. Uh, the Department of Justice is generally the only body that may bring lawsuits against businesses that violate the consumer privacy. However, the only time a consumer may bring a lawsuit is if that business negligently handled their information, and that information is therefore compromised, meaning there was a breach or there was some kind of hack. Uh, this law was enacted, current privacy law was enacted by the legislature and it took effect January 1st, 2020, fairly recently, uh, which means that this law can be changed through regular legislative process. Uh, now that we have an understanding of what current law is like, we can now turn to the proposition. Proposition 24, uh, first and foremost, reduce the number of small businesses that are impacted by California's consumer privacy laws by changing the definition of a business from one that buys, collects, sells, or shares 50,000 consumers information to one that collects, uh, buys, sells, or shares 100,000 consumers information. And it's important to note that that 50,000 uh, consumer threshold is actually a relatively low bar right now. Um, that only requires a website to have 137 visitors per day. So uh, it sweeps up some smaller businesses under California's uh, consumer privacy laws. Uh, secondly, uh, Proposition 24 would expand the right to opt out to include sharing information. Uh, currently, it is uh, you can opt out of the uh, collection and sale of your information, and now uh, you can also opt out of businesses who share your information. And to put this into perspective, uh, consider on annual privacy notices that you may receive, uh, the business might identify its quote unquote aff affiliates that the business then shares your information with and you cannot do anything about that currently. Uh, Proposition 24 would permit a consumer to access the information that a business has collected about them and then that uh, that consumer could require the business to correct inaccurate information. Uh, currently if a business has information about you and that information is incorrect there's nothing you can do about it. Proposition 24 would make it potentially easier to opt out of uh, data collection by permitting a consumer to use this feature called a do not track signal that's built into many web browsers already. Uh, currently, the law only requires a business to respond that it acknowledges that signal. Um, it doesn't have to uh, take that as your affirmative ability to opt out. Uh, so a business only needs to respond that, and say, hey, we see that you have this do not track signal running uh, and we don't acknowledge that, so uh, we're still gonna collect your data. Um, so now Prop 24 would allow a business to interpret that signal as an affirmative opting out. Proposition 24 would expand discrimination protections to protect employees and applicants uh, from an employer who would treat them differently because they've opted out of that data collection. Uh, Proposition 24 would also create a new regulatory agency in California, which would become the largest consumer privacy regulatory body in the United States. 
Currently, the Federal Trade Commission has about 40 employees who deal with consumer privacy, and the Department of Justice has 23 employees. Uh, this new agency would have 50 employees. It would carry an annual budget of around $10 million adjusted for inflation. Uh, the first year would only take $5 million to help the agency get on its feet. Uh, that money would come from the general fund. Uh, and then uh, once that agency is up on its feet, it would take over regulating consumer privacy from the California Department of Justice. Proposition 24 also creates a new category of personal information called sensitive personal information, which the proponents explain is information that is so sensitive, a business should not be able to use it. Examples provided include race, sexuality, financial information, precise geolocation, just to name a few. Um, and Proposition 24 would direct this new regulatory agency to create a law that would ensure a business does not use Californians' sensitive personal information. Uh, an interesting way to put that into perspective would be uh, considering maybe there's a rideshare company out there that sends you a driver based on the color of your skin and based on the color of the skin of the driver. Uh, currently, there's nothing that permits that type of profiling uh, or prohibits that type of profiling and Prop 24 uh, would put in place mechanisms to uh, remove that. It's important to note, Proposition 24 does not create any new rights of private action. It leaves in place uh, government lawsuits, as well as the citizen lawsuit for negligent data handling that led to a breach. Um, and that's a point of critique, but it's important to note that Proposition 24 doesn't foreclose future laws and propositions that would create that private right, private right of action. Uh, and most importantly, uh, Proposition 24 would establish a floor that would protect California's consumer privacy laws from being changed in a way that is contrary to protecting California consumers. Uh, this is one of those amendment clauses that Matt spoke about with Prop 22. Um, here, Prop 24 would still only require a simple majority to change the law. However, it requires any changes to comport with the purpose and intent of Proposition 24. And it provides three pages of purpose and intent, which essentially boils down to protecting California consumers' privacy. If enacted, Proposition 24 would take effect January 1, 2023. Until then, all of the existing laws would remain in force. The only nuance is the uh, Proposition 24 created or create, would create a right to access data that is collected. However, uh, that would only apply to data collected on or after January 1, 2022. Next up, we have Rachel and Yeb speaking about Proposition 25. Thank you. Hello again. So Yev and I will be presenting on Proposition 25, which is actually a referendum to replace the cash bail system with a risk assessment bail system. So what this referendum is seeking to overturn was a Senate bill that was passed by the legislature in August 2018 called SB 10. Um, under current law in California, we use a cash bail system in which a person um, who has the ability to pay a certain amount of money, whether to the court or to a bail agent, will not have to wait in jail until their trial, whereas a person who cannot pay their bail would have to wait in, in jail until um, their trial date or arraignment hearing. Uh, what SB 10 sought to do was to replace that system with a risk assessment system in which um, the courts would analyze whether an arrestee was a public safety risk, where if they were to be allowed to um, leave and not be held in jail until their arraignment hearings or until any court hearings, if they would commit another crime while they were out, or um, if they would be likely to return to court. So they would usually apply um, a risk assessment tool to determine whether or not these people are likely to return to court or if they're a risk to the public. Um, so this referendum is looking to overturn SB 10 and keep the cash bail system. And Yev is gonna tell you a little bit more about the referendum. So uh, the referendum is the power that voters get to either approve or reject statutes enacted by the legislature. So 
when the legislature enacts a law, uh, the voters have, uh, when they file for, for this referendum, they get 90 days to collect a certain, certain amount of signatures. And after they collect those uh, signatures, the statute goes on hold until the voters uh, get to decide what they want to do. So in the case of SB 10, uh, the day after it was signed into law by then, then Governor Jerry Brown, uh, the uh, bail industry ended up filing this referendum in uh, 2018. And so this law was placed on hold up until uh, November of 2020. And so a referendum could be somewhat confusing in that the proponents of a referendum uh, seek a no vote, whereas the opponents of the referendum seek a yes vote in affirming the law. And so with Prop 25, uh, a yes vote would eliminate cash bail in favor of the pretrial risk assessment system. And furthermore, no, no one would pay any fees for the release, whereas a no vote would retain the cash bail system, which was in place prior to 2018, and Senate Bill 10 would not go into effect. So now we're going to tell you a little bit about um, the public policy arguments on both sides. So like Yev was saying, referendums can be a little bit confusing. So the opponents to this referendum are seeking a yes vote so that they can so that the SB 10 bill can be upheld. Their primary arguments um, include that the risk assessment system focuses more on public safety than the cash bail system does. Um, they further argue that the money bail system disadvantages and punishes the poor and people of color. And finally, they also argue that the risk assessment system is less expensive for taxpayers, taxpayers than the cash bail system. And they're seeking for you to vote yes on the Prop 25. So the proponents of this referendum who would like to uh, reinstate cash bail state that the risk assessment system would overburden the courts because they would have to uh, learn this new system and implement it. Uh, further, it increases bias against minorities, and they also quote that uh, SB 10 was opposed by both the ACLU and the NAACP, and it would be very expensive for the taxpayers, in addition to eliminating an entire industry and all the jobs associated with it. So, there we have it. Now on to questions. Yeah, that's all we have for uh, Prop 25. If anybody has any questions, we're happy to answer. Thank you, Yev and Rachel. And I think we, we have um, just a couple of questions left and we have a one minute left. So um, we have one for 25. Let's take a, this question live for 25 and then we will um, wrap things up. So the question for 25 is, doesn't the cash bail system also take into account risks? I.e. the judge uses a risk assessment when determining bail amounts. Um, I can answer that question. So uh, in some counties, the judge does take into consideration um, a risk assessment tool in determining whether or not a person is a flight risk of returning back to court or potentially committing another crime. Um, however, they're not, um, they're not bound by that tool. They're not bound by that risk assessment and a judge can use it their own discretion um, to determine whether or not they want to set a bail or to retain somebody or detain somebody in jail where under um, SB 10, if Prop 25 passes, they would be bound by the risk assessment tool um, for, the, for the low level or the low risk um, arrestees. Thank you very much, uh, Rachel. And thank you to everyone for attending. We are right at 7.30. If there are more questions, we'll hang out for a few minutes to uh, respond to them in the Q&A section. But I do want to once again just um, encourage everyone to look on the website 
and perhaps John will put the link in one more time. You can look at our initiatives at a glance, which are one page summaries or our complete reports that go into a lot more detail about all 12 of the propositions. Thank you all very much for being here. Please vote safely and early and make sure you engage in the political process. We need everyone and thank you all for taking the time tonight. Dean Moylan, we did get one more question about the cash bail system. Okay, Rachel, you can answer it while people are um, going out. And then after you answer it, we'll play the vote song one more time. Go okay. <laughs> um, so Sylvester asked uh, if any other states have gone to, uh, to no cash bail. And we do actually have, we did find in our research some evidence um, that New Jersey has recently passed a law that uh, essentially does the same thing that SB 10 did. Um, and they eliminated cash bail in favor of a risk assessment system. Um, according to our research, the jail population declined or it was on a consistent decline. So it's hard to tell um, whether or not this new bail system um, had a substantial impact. Um, it also, we also found that the cost of the new system um, was about $35 million and it generated only about 22 million. Um, however, there was also evidence that the population of um, African Americans stayed constant. So there's not really evidence that the risk assessment system is more or less uh, biased than the cash bail system. Thanks, Rachel. You and Yev have a few to answer in the um, Q&A while we go ahead and play the song and uh, pan out on the rest of the presentation. Okay, thanks everybody very much.